yes. All right, so our next speaker is Matthias Werner, localization, quantum phase transitions, and graph theory for adiabatic quantum computing. All right, thank you. Can everybody hear me? All right, thank you very much. So I'm Matthias, thank you for the introduction. I'm a PhD student with Kilimanjaro Quantum Tech in Barcelona in Spain, and I will talk a little about uh, localization, quantum phase transitions, and graph theory for adiabatic quantum computing. So what are we investigating? So, well, we're looking at adiabatic quantum computing that um, I assume does not need to be explained in this conference. Um, we have like a driver or initial Hamiltonian interpolate to the target Hamiltonian, which in this ground state has like the solution um, to an optimization problem that we're interested in. And we are limiting our analysis to a case where the target Hamiltonian is diagonal. So it has um, each computational basis state is associated with um, an energy E T zero. And uh, in this basis, the driver Hamiltonian can be thought of as being proportional to the adjacency matrix of a, a simple deregular graph. Simple is just a graph that means it doesn't have any, like each node in this graph only is connected to other nodes, but not to itself. And um, deregular means that it has d different neighbors, right? And this graph G has certain properties, and we want to investigate what are, uh, how these properties relate to, to uh, quantum phase transitions. Um, here the HD is defined as such as the adjacency matrix uh, times minus one over uh, D, which is basically just to, to normalize the, the Hamiltonian. So we always get a ground set NG of minus one. But for this, this class of driver Hamiltonian, the, the uh, ground state is always the, the plus state on all the qubits, which is like the, the common, the common uh, starting ground state. Uh, important to note that the Hamiltonian that's usually used, the sigma x driver, actually falls into this class. So it's uh, that Hamiltonian and a couple of others that uh, are covered by this analysis. And so, uh, how does it relate to the like, quantum phase relation or localization? So in the beginning of the annealing, the system is in a delocalized state. It's a uniform superposition of all the basis states. And as we anneal, so we go from s equals zero to s equals one, um, ideally the system localizes in the global minimum of our optimization problem, which would be our solution. And uh, this is the, the, the green arrow here, the green dynamics, which is typically associated with um, polynomially closing uh, gaps and smooth solution fidelities, which are like the two quantities shown here. Um, but occasionally it happens that the system uh, first localizes in a local minimum and then later has to tunnel through potential barriers to get to the global minimum. And this is typically associated with uh, exponentially closing gaps and discontinuous solution fidelities. Those are the, the red lines in these plots. And we are going to investigate, or the question is a little bit, so why does it localize here in the first place? So how does it come to be? And we, anal and, and, uh, we do the analysis to figure out what are the properties of the driver Hamiltonian graph uh, and the location of the uh, target energies EZ on this graph um, that cause, uh, or would, would that cause one behavior or the other of the system. Um, so how we do this? So first to clarify the, the graph we're dealing with is a graph in, in solution or in configuration space. So each node is a computational basis state and the edges are the, the off diagonal elements of a Hamiltonian typically introduced by the driver. And in this, in this, on this graph, we're gonna have local minima and this local, these local minima, we assume are gonna be um, nearly degenerate. So the uh, energies of all the nodes in, in the set V, which is, uh, is a set of degenerate uh, eigenstates, uh, of the general target eigenstates, all are very, like, very close to the value ETV. And to apply, uh, we're gonna apply degenerate perturbation theory, which means we have to uh, solve this uh, uh, eigenvalue problem on the degenerate subspace V. And the, uh, like the equation is relatively well known, so the, uh, they, the target energy is um, all the same. But uh, here in the driver term, we have like this HD prime, which is basically just the projection of HD onto the subspace. And we um, can think of this HD prime as uh, a driver Hamiltonian that is um, the adjacency matrix of the graph GV, which is the so-called induced subgraph of, uh, yeah, the induced subgraph of G by V, let's say. So um, in the cartoon here, that would be all the nodes in the blue area and all the edges that are entirely in the blue area. And what we're looking for are now the, the 
eigenvector, which it would be the principal eigenvector of the subgraph GV, and the energy, more importantly actually, which is the principal eigenvalue of uh, GV. And this is typically, or this eigenvalue problem is typically not easy to solve, but we can get bounds on the eigenvalue. We can get a lower bound on the energy, which depends on the maximum degree of, of V, which is basically just node in V, which has like the most neighbors. And uh, we get an uh, upper bound that depends on some quantity phi V here that we're gonna discuss in a minute. Um, just a side note, the, those are like quantities that, or these bounds are relatively easy to derive from like standard graph theory uh, knowledge. Like using Gershkin circle theorem, we can uh, verify the upper bound. And uh, using, for example, a variation principle, we can verify the, uh, or the other way around. Using Gershwin circle theorem, we can verify the lower bound. And using a variation principle, we can verify the upper bound. And, well, as I said, the upper bound depends on some quantity phi v, which is called the conductance, uh, the conductance of v. And the uh, conductance is defined as such. It's like the, the size of uh, the edge boundary, which is like this, this partial v symbol here. Um, which is like the set of all the uh, edges that get cut by the dashed line. And just like the magnitude of this, it would be one, two, three, four, five edges, divided by the magnitude of the set V, which is one, two, three. That would be the conductance of the set V. And the conductance is um, uh, a relatively interesting property um, because for all subsets V of, this, of, the, of, uh, of the set of nodes in the graph, um, there's gonna be one non-trivial minimum. So there's gonna be one non-empty subset of nodes with the, with the smallest conductance. And this conductance uh, is called the Chiga constant, which is like a property of the graph. Uh, in our case, it would be the property of, a, of the uh, graph G. And this Chiga constant comes with um, several, or two inequalities actually, so-called Chiga inequalities. And using these inequalities, we can actually um, get, a, or these inequalities give us bounds on the spectral gap of the graph in terms of the, of the Chia constant. And we can massage them a little bit to our purposes and then we can um, basically get co a connection between the Chia constant and the spectral gap of the driver Hamiltonian. So how does this now relate to localization? Well, um, we uh, get like, we calculate the energies of the localized state, of the state that would be localized in the global minimum and the state that would be localized in the local minimum. There were uh, green, blue, and orange here in these, in these cartoons. And um, the, uh, these straight lines here are the respective energies. And we calculate those energies up to first order perturbation theory. That's why they're straight lines and not curved or anything. And, oh, I already went too fast, sorry. So we can calculate the uh, energy of the delocalized state, the green one, by uh, treating uh, the target Hamiltonian as a perturbation on the driver Hamiltonian, and by treating the driver Hamiltonian as a perturbation on H uh, on the target, we can get the, the energies on the uh, state that's localized in the global and the state that's localized in the local minimum. And um, so basically we do perturbation theory twice, once from the beginning towards the end and once from the end towards the beginning. And um, how, to, how would you read this or how we would interpret this is, is that in the beginning of the annual, the system is in the localized state, and it would, you know, we tune S, we tune S, we tune S, and eventually the, the delocalized energy crosses with a um, state that would be localized. And this is where the system then has to transition into the localized state. And we continue annealing, and eventually the state that's localized in the local minimum is gonna cross with the one that's localized in the global minimum, which is then the, the point where it would need to tunnel from the local minimum to the global minimum. And obviously that's not going to happen if these, the lines between um, local and global minimum do not never cross. But even if they cross, there's a scenario when we actually get the uh, process um, where the system localized directly, namely when the localized localized transition happens um, before the delocalized to global transition. So that would be this scenario. The system is uh, delocalized, 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 and then transitions directly into the global minimum. This corresponds to this type of dynamics here. Um, so we might be able to say a lot about this process if we knew this uh, localized localized transition, these red stars here. And given the, the bounds that we derived on the previous section, we can actually um, get bounds on the location of this, um, I call it S star here, where the localized localized transition is happening. We get a lower bound that's uh, conditioned on the, or depends on the conductance of the um, local minimum, and we get an upper bound that con depends on the uh, maximum degree. So sometimes I would call them like the conductance bound and the degree bound. Okay, so about these bounds. Um, there's a few things to note. 
first, um, they actually equal if uh, the GV is a regular graph. So, uh, uh, yeah, if GV had, and all the nodes in GV have the same number of edges, then these bounds are equal, and then we can actually determine the uh, star exactly. And the lower bound ends up being asymptotically tied if the local minimum can be described by a large edge of any graph. And now, can we make statements about whether or not we would be seeing these localized localized transitions for um, particular problem instances? Well, yes. Uh, the um, E global and uh, E delocalized are, um, can be calculated. I earlier just mentioned that it's possible, but here are the actual expressions. And uh, these two expressions are going to be equal for some S prime. And S prime is basically where the delocalized to, uh, uh, the delocalized to global minimum transition is happening. And if S prime is larger than the upper bound, then we're certainly in the regime where we would see the delocalized to global minimum transition directly. And if S prime is smaller than the lower bound, then we are certainly in the regime where uh, the delocalized state would first transition into a global min uh, into a local minimum, and then it has to tunnel into a global minimum. And if S prime is between those bounds, then it's actually hard to tell, and we can't really know. And um, first to note is that, uh, okay, so the upper bound, uh, the, the lower bound, the conductance bound is actually tied under, like under in, in both of these scenarios, actually. So, and that will come up with the numerical results. Maybe there's, some, or that's kind of work in progress, but um, it might maybe that the, there's, uh, or it, and if the um, low energy states of the system are well enough described by either of these two scenarios, then we can actually give, um, uh, give bounds in terms of the Chia constant and as a consequence also in terms of the spectral gap of the driver Hamiltonian, when we would, for any problem instances, or for any problem instance, not expect to see a, a localized, localized transition. Um, but this might be related to like symmetries of the problem, but that's kind of like a topic that we're working on right now. <laughs> so stay tuned. So let's uh, look at some numerical results we have for that. So um, we first look at some very simple toy problem where we just generate like random regular graphs. And then some point in the graph, we um, locate the narrow global minimum. And at some other point in the graph, we generate like an arbitrarily shaped, arbitrarily deep uh, local minimum. We just make sure that they're disjoint. So, because if they're not disjoint, then this is kind of a different story. But um, for uh, now, we want to assume those are disjoint. Uh, that the global minimum and the local minimum are disjoint. And then here in the top part, we can see basically the numerical um, computation of the of the cartoons I showed before. So in blue, we have the uh, energy of the global minimum state. Uh, in green, we have the delocalized state. And in orange, because we have a bounce on it, it's like uh, this this orange shaded area. That's where the energy of the uh, local minimum state uh, happens to be. And in, in the black line here, I hope you can see it. Yeah, I can see it right. And the black line, that's actually the, the exact diagonalization that we get from these problem instances, for example. So um, systems first in the delocalized state and then transitions to the local minimum. And later, somewhere between the, um, yeah, somewhere in this, in this shaded area, which is like the, the bounds that we get on the S star, uh, this is where the um, system would need to tunnel from the local minimum to the global minimum. And um, uh, we can actually see that the discontinuity in the ground state fidelity is actually quite well, just like pretty much smack that in the middle of the uh, of these of these bounds that we're given, as well as the minimum gap. On the so this com corresponds to the dynamics where systems first localize and transitions then. And on the left hand side, we see the same dynamics where um, the the conditions are given that we would not see the localized localized transition. So the system goes directly from delocalized to uh, localized in the global minimum which we can also tell by the smoother ground state fidelity and the uh, actually somewhat larger gap. But this was, a, um, if we do that, well, if we do that for uh, several random problem instances, and we assume that actually the uh, minimum spectral gap is exactly at the localized localized transition, um, we can basically do that several times and, and plot the predicted S minimum versus the observed S minimum. So the predicted is gonna be the bounds here, and the bounds seem to be crossing the diagonal fairly accurately or cons consistently. Um, so this seems to be a <laughs> well-working uh, prediction. Uh, the color coding is that in the blue case, we are certainly in a scenario where we see the localized localized transition. The red regime is where we certainly do not see the localized localized transition, and the orange ones are like the, the in-between cases. And um, in terms of like the green dots are showing the uh, second order perturbation theory. That is some analysis that was done before by uh, Amit and Shoy. And um, that's a paper that's linked here that's uh, several years old already. And um, they use non-degenerate perturbation theory. 
And um, it, we can see that it seems to be working up here relatively nicely, but generally um, it's not as close to the diagonal as you would like it to be. And we believe there's a reason for that, namely um, uh, here the straight lines, so this is by the way a plot that's taken directly from the paper, so thank you. Uh, but the uh, straight lines are the first order energy corrections according to non-degenerate perturbation theory. And these lines, these lines will never cross. So you will not observe uh, level crossings um, with first order non-degenerate perturbation theory. So they need to go to second order to first observe the, uh, the, the level crossings. While with the degenerate perturbation theory that we are applying, we can actually already see it at first order. So um, we would argue that the, the energy corrections that lead to the level crossings are actually a first order effect rather than a second order effect. And um, in the paper, they also present like a weighted minimum independent set problem, uh, which we also reproduced. So the plot here to the right is um, very like a very very close uh, reproduction of one of the plots in the actual paper. And let me. But me. Uh, so the, the uh, red line shows um, the exact diagonalization solution or this location of the minimum gap for, obtained by exact diagonalization for various problem instances of this weighted minimum independent set uh, as characterized by the depth of the local minimum WL. And the predictions made by second order non-degenerate perturbation theory are the blue lines. And we can see that the graph theoretic bounds that we derive, okay, the, the, the lower bounds are um, kind of similar actually to the previous plot very close to the exact uh, solution, while the upper bound is uh, off and kind of actually matches more the second or non-degenerate perturbation uh, solution. Um, but I suspect that's more coincidence than actually systematic, but we'll think about that a little more. And with that, I'm through. Uh, thank you for the attention. A quick summary. So we discussed the origin and the location of the first order quantum phase conditions uh, with first order degenerate perturbation theory. And this allows us to map it to properties from uh, uh, graph theory describing those local minima, and we can derive bounds on when, when and where, or under which circumstances, and where we would expect to see localized, localized conditions. Um, if it happens to be that the lower bound is actually uh, tight, like the conductance bound is tight, then we can also co formulate some, some general conditions, which would tell us for a certain problem class that when, on, when we would not expect to see those transitions. And um, yeah, we'll kind of work to come is we are researching um, inequalities that kind of bring the, the, the degree bound in this also. So we, and how to map this to like problems or how to analyze the symmetries of problems with that and what we can do about that. And with that, um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Very interesting, inspiring talk. Uh, I want to ask the first question actually. <laughs> so uh, uh, the quantity phi, uh, how, how hard is it to calculate it and in terms of its computational complexity? Um, so computational complexity, I can tell you, I have to research algorithms on that. Like so far I've been doing it by hand and it's tedious. But in terms of complexity, I don't know yet, no. But is, is there a reason to assume that uh, it's polynomial time in general? Mm -hmm. Well, so it's more like a theoretical analysis. So it requires that you already know what the uh, states are that you're looking for. So it's, um, you would need to know what states belong to this uh, local minimum, and that's kind of like solving the problem, right? So, um. yeah, I have the following question. So, imagine you take some typical optimization problem like Sherrington Kirkpatrick or any other. So, now you're telling us that there could be two different phase transitions. Now, my question is the second one when you are tunneling between to localized states, probably the gap will be exponentially small in N, yes. right? And the first one, do you know it should scale like one over N in some power? Could you say something about it, yeah? Uh, no, it's, um, so, I can say very little about it actually, other than just like, a, like the lo delocalized localized transition, something that's unavoidable basically for this problem class. So we have to hope that it's polynomial. Otherwise, uh, sorry? What? You have to hope for what? We have to hope that it's polynomial in size. If it would be all, if we could show that it's always exponential, then we have like large problems, or complicated problems on our hands. Okay, but actually there are not so many studies. There is some paper by Knish, okay, about some, what is this problem? It's, it's analog of Sherrington Kirkpatrick. 
where he was telling that the first gap is polynomial in N. And then he could have sequence of next gaps, yeah, which should be exponentially small in N, which would match to your picture. Yeah. Yeah, but, but he always had first gap, which was polynomial in N, but probably it is model specific. Uh, mm -hmm. I would assume, yeah, but um, yeah. Any more questions? Thank you. Um, is there any reason why you might suspect that um, that the driver Hamiltonian you could find any advantage from making it, you know, non-stochastic? Uh, then maybe. Um, so this. Um, so there's one paper from Little Croissant, I believe, where they do this analysis numerically and find actually that. Non-stochastic Hamiltonians tend not to increase the gap, uh, rather decrease. So, um, I would say that generally, for j just generally, probably not. But if you design the Hamiltonian specifically to the problem you're trying to solve, then there's a chance, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, is our next speaker here?